passionate in what you're doing. This rings true because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard, and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, and if you're not having fun doing it, you're gonna give up. to another episode of John's Untitled Podcast, a partner of MoshPitNation.com. This week's guest is Dave Malilo, formerly of himself, and cute is what we aim for. And uh, with me, as always, is Daniel Terry. How are you doing? Doing good, man. This was a good chat. It was pretty good. And, you know, I got to say, uh, I had a random day off because I hit my dog in the face with a tennis ball, actually in the eye. Uh, so I stayed home because I thought I was going to take her to the vet and they were booked up. So it just turned into a day of hanging out with my dog. You and... got rewarded for being the worst kind of person. Got it. Yep. And, uh, yeah. So a friend of mine, uh, who I've mentioned on the podcast a couple of times, uh, Ross, uh, over at enjoy the ride records reached out to me and had a new project, uh, that he's getting ready to release, uh, on Friday as of the day or the Friday coming up. Uh, this is going to go up on Wednesday. And uh, I didn't know much about Dave, nor his story. Uh, Ross gave me literally like a, I think like a paragraph rundown, like a quick little bio, an EPK bio of sorts. And it just so happened, uh, and I think I mentioned it in the chat, I was watching the 30 Seconds to Mars documentary, uh, Artifact. Have you seen that? Uh, no, I haven't seen that one yet. It's pretty wild. It's uh, basically, it's a, a documentary that was supposed to be about the band making what would eventually become This Is War. Oh, Okay. And it uh, turned into basically the unfolding of the band's lawsuit that they were going through with their label for $30 million. Jeez, just chump change. Yeah, and so it follows the band kind of making the record in the midst of a lawsuit, a lot of the issues of the lawsuit itself, and then subsequently a lot of the bands on the band's label, EMI, uh, leaving the record labeled for various things and... It was really interesting, but it just kind of when you're done, it's like, man, if this happens to a band of this this level where ba- like literally the label never paid the band for any of the records they sold because they said that they were still in the red and they hadn't recouped their costs, which, I mean, 30 Seconds to Mars is basically an arena-level band anywhere they go. So the fact that they don't sell enough records is kind of shocking to me. Well, it's kind of funny because I remember a few years ago, it's probably like 10 years ago or 15 yeah. years ago, I saw 30 Seconds to Mars open for Incubus Mm -hmm. here in St. Louis, and it was funny because everybody was complaining about how shitty they were. And then it's just kind of funny to me that, you know, because, like, Incubus fans are very loyal. So anything that's not Incubus, they say, is just, you know, total shit. Right. But in this particular regard, I thought the band did an amazing job, and I was, like, really stoked. I must have been the only one that was like, oh, my God, Jared Leto is here. Well, but yeah, it was funny it was just funny to me that they said they were shitty and then they literally went on to become one of the biggest bands you know in in rock music and uh yeah that's really sad that they didn't get paid shit for for any of their stuff i mean it's like i think now we're starting to see the downfall of the major record label business model right and you know they could just string bands along forever because you know they'll they'll take you out on tour they'll pay for all your shit but at the end of the day they're gonna just like Right, at, you know, they're always keeping tabs, and uh, whatever bullshit reason they can they can come up with to not pay you, that's what they go with, and it's kind of thematic with the talk you know that you were ha- that you had today, and that like, you know, you you have an original idea, an original thought, an original sound, and people will just kind of like, you know, they're interested in you initially, and you feel good about what you're doing, and then you write some songs for them, and they're like, oh. This sucks. You need to push yourself to do more, you know? And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just weird hearing all these stories coming out now about how, like, these major labels are basically, like, faltering. Like, they're they're stifling their artists, which is, you know, really their meal ticket, right? Yeah, no, it, uh, it was just really crazy because, like, I, and like I said in the interview, I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't really prep. I felt like, the headspace I was in after watching that documentary and just knowing a lot of behind the scenes type stuff, like the story that Ross was telling me about Dave's, 
it's all too familiar. I mean, we, we hear so much about it now. And, you know, especially in the day and age of, like, you know, the Thursdays and the Day to Remembers and everyone coming forth about victory. And, you know, I had Nate uh, on from Finch, who was on Drive Through Records at one point. And, you know, just, you know, I, I don't need, mean to necessarily make it seem like, you know, record labels are out to fuck everybody. But, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, a friend of mine's band is was looking and being shopped to a label and one of the the biggest you know a and r dudes in the the metal scene in the last like 20 years was he like you know i found this band and was like oh i'm shopping them to this label and he goes however i mean i didn't know you guys were as old as you are and i definitely wouldn't tell people that right away uh because you know no one's going to want to sign you if they don't think they have a lot of years to to take you know to put into you and it was just kind of one of those things where it's like you know on the one hand that you know i kind of respected the 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 for, f- forwardness of that but it's just kind of like man like this you know this band's been around for like 20 years they have all basically all their original members they tour as much as they can and it's like you know they have a good sounding record and you know like the the dude said it's like it still sounds current so obviously you know how to like keep up with trends and so forth uh without sounding like you're mimicking anybody and it's just like one of those things where it's like you know by all accounts he's like yeah everything's great however your age is what's the deterrent and it's like jesus so and it's like i get it like you know no one wants to hire someone that's or you know invest in someone that's potentially not going to be around but it's like on the flip side of that it it just kind of reminds me of like when you're going for a job and they either tell you you don't have enough experience or that you don't have uh you know that you don't have like oh you're you we need you to have a degree and then it's like sometimes you'll go to another place and they're like oh well you have the degree but you don't have any real life experience doing this so it's like you're you're damned if you do and damned if you don't yeah it's a really weird world that we live in now and like i mean granted a lot of these practices are a little outdated now but like a really good example too was um was taproot yeah yeah you know, ran, ran into that with with their label you know where it was like they were, you know, really hot shit. I mean, I think anybody that you hear the name Taproot, they figure, oh, these guys were just as big as anybody else. And then, you know, behind the scenes, it's like, oh, no, they're, like, basically being forced to write this, like, insanely, you know, hooky record, you know, with all these hits, and they reject everything the band comes up with. And it's like, well, shit, you made your initial investment on me. And now I'm not good enough to, to return on that investment, you know? And uh, it's just kind of a mind fuck that some of these labels put uh, put the band through. I mean, look at uh, look at Hope's Fall and Trust Kill. Yeah. You know, it was kind of the same kind of thing. I mean, Hope's Fall was a band that was, like, really um, influential with their sound and their scene. They were a well-respected band. However, the record label put them through such a mind fuck that they really just all hung it up and said, I guess we're not that important and just moved, you know, moved away. And, uh, and that's really sad to see, you know, a lot of bands disappear like that. And that's what I thought was cool about this chat was that, you know, we finally have an artist that's able to take that shelved album and release it, you know, as it was intended to be released. Yeah. I mean, these are basically just the, the writing sessions for the demos. Basically. I don't think this is, these are finalized, Things. it's not a yeah it's not a recorded album but you know what i'm saying like yeah, just yeah. this yeah. is the artist being like this is what i had wanted to bring you yeah you know a vision of that well speaking of bringing things to you let's uh go ahead and get into this chat with, with dave malilo and we'll return after that <laughs> So I have the pleasure this afternoon of talking with Dave Malillo. Um, mm. It's it's kind of funny how this all came about. Literally, probably about three hours ago, uh, mutual friend Ross uh, from Enjoy the Ride Records reached out to me and uh, had actually the last few days been talking about this project that he's been working on with you, uh, releasing. Is it safe to say a an unreleased uh, album, like a kind of like a lost album of sorts? Yeah, like songs in the attic you know, dusting them off and, and, uh, giving them to the masses. Yeah. Fair. So before we get to this, this record and, and the whole 
thing that happened with this thing. Um, you know, you had been signed to Drive Through Records, uh, which was a, a really big label and a really important label for for people like myself and Ross, and and I'm sure like yourself. You know, people in our kind of mid to late 30s and older, you know, with bands like Finch and so forth, you know, they were a, a really big label to kind of break younger bands. And, you know, a lot of those records would go on to, you know, still uh, be, you know, incendiary albums and, and seminal albums for a lot of people. And, you know, they ended up putting out your, your EP, Talk is Cheap. So how did the label come to find you and what was it like working with the album or working with them on your first EP and going into this, what would subsequently be the next album? Yeah, like at the beginning, it was a dream come true, as you can imagine, John, as a a high school kid, you know, I remember getting the Sense of Fail EP. Right. And that's, that's when, like, I, I really started to believe that I could do it. You know, like, I was like, oh, these guys are 15 years old or whatever they were. They were really young guys, and they were from New Jersey. And, you know, I was like, I saw myself in them. And so, you know, I turned around and I started bands, and I, I just started doing, you know, that, that progressed into me doing my own thing uh, acoustically. And... And yeah, it kind of happened quick for me, which is might be the reason why it didn't stick or I didn't appreciate it. But that's a that's kind of a whole other piece of the story. But but basically, you know, I just started sending my demos out to Richard, who was pretty accessible on on AOL Instant Messenger back in the day. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, he started listening to some of my stuff, and you know, uh, one thing led to another, and I went out to the drive-through studios. I played for the office, and that you know, that got into a deal. But I mean, it happened super fast. I was like a, a junior or a sophomore in high school. So it was literally like living the dream. Like I bought the census fail EP. And then like, you know, 13 months later, I was on the label. So it seemed like it was everything that I could have ever asked for that quickly, you know, turned into something different. You know, something that I, I have kind of brought up, uh, even with Nate from Finch, I had him and his wife on a while ago, and, you know, just awesome. kind of talking to a lot of bands from that time period, or just a lot of bands in general, because I, th you know, I think we can both agree that a lot of label people will sign bands young because they can invest in them for a longer period of time and or potentially take advantage of their naivety. And something that, you know, has always kind of interested me looking back now as a 30-something on that is... You know, you get signed when you're in high school, and you're not even a fully developed adult. You know, you're still trying to figure out who you are and all that kind of stuff. And now, you know, you sign a, a record contract, and you're responsible for putting out product and making someone money. And just how much of a different kind of life that is for someone who, like I said, is, you know, at 13, <laughs> 14, you know, I'm probably thinking about getting up the nerve to ask a girl out, let alone to be like, hey, uh, you know, Mr. Person at a like, record label, will you sign me and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, I've always kind of liked asking people, you know, what was it like kind of growing up literally very quickly because of the circumstances that you found yourself in? Yeah, that's a really great point. I think it manifests itself in people a lot differently. I think I'm very lucky that I had involved parents because I thought that they were being kind of jerks back in the day, but I definitely realize now that they were just trying to make sure that I was still a person at the end of all this if it didn't turn out well. So I have to give a lot of credit to them for keeping me grounded. Um, but it was a lot of pressure. I lost a lot of friends. Um, I lost a lot of self-esteem. I mean, as you can imagine – you get a lot of self-esteem, you know, having a record label that you idolize sign you and it's so easy. And then, you know, as you're submitting songs or, or you're trying to get out into the market and people aren't buying your T-shirts and your record label tells you that every song that you write sucks, like it's a complete mind fuck, man. So, right. um, you know, that can really, again, that's tough for someone who is 20 and 30 and is developed, right? That, that's hard to cope with that. When you have zero coping skills at all and you're still just trying to like you know figure out who you are and what you're trying to do with your life um it, it has even more of an effect and so like for me it i'm sure a lot of people get bad habits doing drugs you know drinking um you know just just being a, a terrible person in general um and i i can't say that i i averted all of that but i will say that you know my family kept me grounded and you know, I, I, I definitely came out on the other side. Pro probably the only reason why I did 
is because of them. But um, yeah, man, it had a, a massive influence on my psyche and my development. But now I can look back on it and kind of wear it as a badge of honor. And, uh, and it taught me a lot. Like there's, there's nothing like learning when you're on the road, you know, and like you pull up to a venue and the promoter isn't there and the show's canceled and you just drove like 3000 miles. And then you learn the value of building relationships with people that you could trust. You know, you could go to business school for four years and never learn that. But like, I learned a ton of those types of lessons you know, like building a network, right? We used to have a, we used to have a sign up sheet at the merch table for like <laughs> win a sleepover with the band. And I'm sure I'm not like the, the last guy, but I mean, you know, that kind of was before social media and all that. And you see what the value of having a network of people is now. And, you know, people make their lives off of being influencers on Instagram and shit like that. So, you know, I learned a lot of those really important marketing business and like essential life skills out on the road. So Aside from, you know, the complete mindfuck uh, element of it, there was a lot of good that I got out of it that I never would have gotten if I just kind of had a normal, you know, adolescent experience. Right. You know, it, it is really, it's really interesting. You know, like I said, I, I just constantly think of, you know, living here in Michigan and, and kind of having, you know, friends in bands like For the Fallen Dreams and Guys and Still Remains and so forth. And just kind of thinking about how, you know, when, when they're cor- – well, for the fallen dreams are still kind of going at this point, but still remains is is kind of inactive, and you know are kind of you know doing the dad and married life thing and so forth. And it's just kind of interesting to think about how for a long time living in this town, it'd be like, oh, there's a girl seeing someone's girlfriend, but it's like, oh, the band's over in Europe, and yeah. you know, and then it's like when they come home, everyone's like, oh, there's so and so from this band, but oh, well, no, not really anymore. Uh, and it's it's just kind of weird to see, and that was kind of the the catalyst for me starting to think about how perception and and just how you know people living this other life how it's different for them to go on in their day-to-day life uh just in general but then you know because there's this perception of who you are versus you know who you actually are and you know that changes based on you know the guy at a label your girlfriend your family your friends your even your bandmates you know it's just interesting to think about how all of those different relationships change and how everyone needs something different from you because of this extraordinary situation that you have found yourself in that's that's unlike a lot of people's situations at that point yeah and you hit on a couple of good things there like first if you cannot separate your identity from what you do musically then you're bound to to hit a really rough spot and again that's something that i did i mean i i identified myself as the kid who got signed to drive through records right And so as soon as, again, as soon as that wasn't a good situation or that wasn't the way I wanted to identify myself, it's tough because that's who you are. I had that same problem when I became the bass player, cute is what we aim for, because I was now identified and I still am to this day as that dude and cute is what we aim for. So, (laughs) you know, it's really important that you have perspective and that, yeah, it's great that you, you build this character and this brand, but you have to have stuff for you. Or, else, you know, you have to have friends, you have to have family, you have to have like an actual life and be a real person or else, you know, you're going to ride a really tough roller coaster. And, you know, the other thing that you hit on is that it's a completely different life. Like you get access to things, experiences, people, places that you would never get access to before just because you're doing X, Y and Z. And when I was with more when I was with cute is what we aim for. I saw it, but um, definitely even, you know, myself, like I was just, I got to be in, in situations that I should not have been in. I got to be in rooms that I should not have been in and doing things I should not have been doing. And, you know, after transitioning to, I live a very normal life now. And it's just so funny. People just look at you totally differently. Like you, you can't get into places as easily, you know, you don't have a tour laminate everywhere you go. Right. Um, it's just like, uh, it's a really different life. And I think that fucks with people a lot too, man, because when you come from a life where every day, like, you know, you are a VIP in your, like your own experience mm-hmm. and then you come back. And I, I, I remember when I tried to transition coming off the road, sometimes like I would get upset that I like, had to wait for certain things. And that's like <laughs> such a bullshit attitude to have, but you, you have to understand that it's, like go, like turning that on and off if you don't that's like a skill in itself and if you don't develop that and you just kind of like ignore it it can get 
like that that's where you see people develop these like sociopathical and like weird tendencies like as you know, as rock stars, so to speak. You know, does that make sense? No, totally. I mean, I kind of, even with this podcast and, and like having, like I said, you know, having friends in the industry in various levels of either being musicians, being TMs, being techs, whatever, you know, I've been kind of afforded a little bit of that. And yeah. it's one of those where I, I don't ever ask for it because I know that's shitty. But the thing, I always appreciate everything that anyone's willing to give me because, you know, I've, kind of in a band way and this is going to sound again really shitty but it's like i've gone to so many concerts i've bought so many you know i've I've kind of paid the dues so it's like when i get hookups on stuff it's like well i mean i'm still either bringing someone with me who's you know paying to get in i'm still gonna buy shirts or merch or something like it's not it's not just a one-sided thing from my perspective and i think the other thing too is and i think you could probably attest to this from you know being on the road People aren't going to do that if you're a shitty person. Like, they're only going to be nice and extend things to people that there's, you know, friendship or, you know, you want someone to hang, you want to hang out with that person because, you know, you're genuinely friends or whatever. But I guess it would kind of get hard too. And sometimes what I wonder, you know, in doing this podcast, like I have, is sometimes I try to find the, find that balance where, you know, like I just had a friend that's in like the torch. They were on tour with uh, Guar here a couple of, like about a week ago. And, you know, I, I did an interview with the singer from Guar, but then when that was done, like I was there to hang out with my friend and yeah. you kind of, you know, you already said you kind of got to compartmentalize your life a little bit. So it's like, it's kind of hard when I showed up and he was like, Hey dude, what's up? And I was like, yeah, not much. Uh, I, you know, I got to get this interview. I'll talk to you later. And he's like, yeah, I got sound checks. So it's like, it's when you're able to kind of have that mutual thing of like, okay, we're both kind of working in this situation, but as soon as, like, we're done, then that part of our professional life sort of is done, and now we get to hang out and be friends. I, I think that's sort of the hard part for me, or has been, is just kind of realizing, like, wow, I'm I'm kind of press or a media now, and I need to act one way in one situation, but I, then when that's all done and I'm not doing that, then I kind of need to turn that off and just be a normal person, if that makes sense. It, that does make sense. It's weird. I was thinking about this last night. I'm not sure why, but uh, it's all about not buying into your own bullshit. So if you're the press, you're the media, you're a band member, you're not like as soon as you start buying your own brand and your own story and you start believing your own shit way too much, that's when it's that's when it's a bad circumstance. You know, um, like having that reality to realize you're just a dude or a, or a dudette and you're just lucky to be there. <laughs> I, you know that's that's how you stay grounded and that's how thing how that's how the story ends well you know i think that everyone that you see where the story doesn't end well or they hit a rough patch it's because they don't have that moment where they come back and, and then they're just friends you know right you, you, you get stuck in like oh i just interviewed the dude from guar and now i am fucking cool like <laughs> as soon as you think you're cool you are not cool <laughs> that's, right it's kind of that's my new rule for all this but uh but yeah, it, so- it sounds like you. It sounds like you're doing okay, John. I don't think you have anything to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I and you know very much like a band. I think there needs to be that that thing too, where you believe in your own brand, and that's what pushes you to to kind of build yourself up. But like you said, you need to have that moment of clarity or that check that you know you need to not be so high on yourself either too. And and, and that's kind of hard there, especially you know when you got people who are kind of up your own ass at times, and you're just like, oh. I mean, I guess, like, I guess that's, you know, I, I go, I'm good or whatever. Like, and you know, that's, that's kind of the thing is I think, uh, you know, that was kind of interesting about, you know, your story with this and we'll kind of segue this into, you know, what was supposed to be your, your next album, you know, you get a lot of praise for this EP and, you know, it's time to make this next, your, your next full length. And, you know, you worked with, if uh, I mean, I saw the one of the producers on it. Uh, I didn't see how many tracks it was. But, I mean, you're working with John Feldman, arguably at the peak of John Feldman being John Feldman before, John he, Feldman. before yeah. he is what he has become now. And, you know, like, you're working with producers like that, and it's like, you got to feel like, man, this is about to fucking happen. Like, story of the year, blowing up the U's, just blew up. Like, I'm working with that dude. And how could his Midas touch not extend to what we're working on? And and I'm not the next in this succession. So a, I want to ask, what is it like working with John Feldman? And then B kind of what the fuck happened? (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, that that's a really good uh, that's a really good question. So, a, I, I think the the first one is positive. So we'll start with that. Working with John Feldman. Now, you, again, you have to understand, I was so into Goldfinger when I was like in middle school. It's when Tony Hawk Pro Skater came out. Oh yeah. And Superman was like the title track on it. I got so into Goldfinger. They were my first concert. So already I'm going into this experience. Like, not only is he John Feldman, he's fucking John Feldman from Goldfinger, who I, you know, he was the guy that I wanted to be uh, from the beginning. So it was a surreal experience. And then even after I did my solo stuff, um, Cute Is What We Aim For recorded their next album that I was part of with John Feldman. So working with him was awesome. He is a no-nonsense guy. He's there to get the job done. And he, you might not... Um, you know, you might not enjoy some of the ways that he goes about doing things because he's very much business and he's going to do what he has to do to get the best sound out of the instrument and the player that he has to. But I really enjoyed it because that's kind of my style too. And I just, I loved him. So I, I had a really positive experience, but I, I know not everyone that was working with him at the same time that I was had a similar experience. So you know, I, I could give credit to either or, but I, still to this day, I mean, if that guy called me up and asked me to be on his new label, wink, wink, I would totally be into it. But um, yeah, so what the fuck went wrong? I, you know, I don't know. And uh, maybe it's a little bit more clear to everyone else than it is to me. Uh, but yeah, I just, I got stonewalled by drive through. I basically, you know, I kept, I kept producing songs, kept producing songs, like with John Feldman, with this guy, Johnny Andrews, who wrote... Um, a bunch of great songs with uh, with the guy from Better Than Ezra. His name mm -hmm. was Kevin something, Kevin Griffin, who yeah. uh, wrote like a, a famous Howie Day song. So I, you know, I started off just doing my own thing because I was like, hey, I want to make my own record. I was even like, I'm going to play all the instruments on it, just like Bryce from The Rocket Summer, because I'm that guy. <laughs> and you know what? I had to take a step down and say, OK, Drive Through Records is telling me that everything I'm doing by myself sucks. Let me go work with these producers and so that, you know, they understand I'm really serious about this. After I did that and they said no, I realized that I no longer had control over the situation and that I had one of two options, right? I could sit there like bands like uh, Socratic, um, you know, like House of Fools, a lot of the bands that were on the, that label that were really good bands, like even like Steel Train was a really good band and they were actually able to get records out but at the end of the drive through thing, it actually didn't fucking matter because even their releases were half-assed. So uh, to be honest with you, as soon as I realized that I had made the wrong decision and I was in the wrong spot, I wasn't even as concerned about getting an album out as I was about getting the fuck out of a burning building, right? Because I think that's the best metaphor that I can explain. It's almost like as soon as I stepped into the drive through building, the fucking place caught on fire. And, you know, that's just bad market timing on my end. But, you know, for me, I was like, I need to get out. And when I realized that they wouldn't let me out, um, that's when I, I looked for a different way to do what I wanted to do, but not be a part of them. That's when a transition to cute is what we aim for. And for better or for worse, that's kind of where my story was taken. But, um, but yeah, man, I, honestly, I, uh, I'm very much about reciprocity and it was very frustrating it was very clear and very frustrating that i wasn't going to get anything out of drive through like i signed a four record deal with these people and they weren't even going to let me do one record so so you got to think about it even if i was able to squeeze one record out of them what were they going to do were they going to make it difficult for me to produce every record and then even if they did release a record for me were they going to put anything behind it was it just going to be a flop? So, you know, for me, it was, uh, it was more about like, well, how do I continue as a career musician? Like, how can I make this into a good situation um, rather than just dwelling on the fact that I was part of, you know, I was stuck in this burning building. So uh, I think it's probably a little bit of impatience, a little bit of just really bad market timing. Like I, I can't tell you, John, how badly, uh, how much of a bad decision I make. I don't know. If, have you heard the podcast at all that I've done or like the story or anything like that? No, because unfor unfortunately, uh, no, this was, cool. this was just it's such cool. a quick chat. Like literally, I mean, 
this was like I said, uh, probably three hours ago. It was a uh, hey, let's do this, and I was in the midst of doing something else. And like I said, I was watching that uh, Thirty Seconds to Mars documentary. And the other thing too is like sometimes I, I've kind of found that not going through and listening to other interviews has kind of helped me make my own my own because I'm not piggybacking off of someone else's questions. Yes. Yes. No. The only reason I said it is because it's kind of like it's people like laugh at me and like, I think people feel bad for me, but I'm, I'm so past the point of feeling bad for myself that I don't like, it's not a big deal to me anymore. So it's like, it's like I got in a really bad car accident and I could just talk about it now. Cause it was, you know, it was a long time ago. Right. But basically when I had to drive through, I had two choices. I could go with drive through records or I could go with this upstart label called fueled by ramen who <laughs> had a really cool up and coming band called fallout boy mm-hmm. who like just released this song, uh, this album called take this to your grave. That was kind of taken off and had just signed this like really like mousy girl named Haley Williams to their label who they wanted to put me on tour with. So, you know, me being, you know, fucking smart, I was like, no, fuck those guys. I'm going to go with the sure thing and drive through records. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, looking back on that, it's just very, very, I just made a very bad decision uh, at like the worst possible time that I could have made it. So I, I, unfortunately in music, I think a lot of it comes down to luck. Uh, I think, I don't really think hard work has much to do with it because I've seen way too many people who have no idea what they're doing be very, very successful. So, you know, uh, maybe that's a jaded view of things and just, you know, from my own perspective. But, you know, that's why I don't really have an answer for what exactly happened except that I just made the wrong call. Uh, I juked juked right when I probably should have juked left. (laughs) Pizza when you should have French fried. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, kind of in... in sort of wrapping this up since you got to get ready to go to work um did you ever think that the songs the writing sessions for these this what was supposed to be the the new lp did you ever think in light of everything going the way it did that these songs would ever see the light of day not really i i actually even went through like a time not like in 2012 where i was releasing mixtapes and these are like brand new songs so like i I left these songs for dead way, way in the past. Um, although I thought they were really great, but I like, I moved on as an artist and things like that. And, you know, any artist will tell you that it's kind of tough to revisit, especially when you're a teenager, like you don't want to go listen to shit that you did when you were a teenager. Think about like reading essays that you wrote when you were in (laughs) fucking high school. No one does that. So it's like the same kind of thing. Um, so I kind of left these songs for dead, but, um, you know, kind of going to it's very interesting now because it's like a time capsule right um it not only represents like a certain sound it represents a certain time uh it represents my story like you know i can listen to all these songs and i understand where where i was like whether i was at home or i was on the road or something like that and so it's really cool it's like a it's like a scrapbook and like a photo album and like a, a memory box all in one. And that's why there's a whole story that goes along with this release. And that's why, you know, talking to you is like really important. And I'll be blogging uh, as a part of this release and just like putting out the stories behind these songs, because I think it's an, it's an all encompassing release. Like I never thought that these, these songs would reach the light of day to your point. But I also never thought that like I'd actually have this much of a story to tell around these songs. But because of what I've been through at this point, like it's all very appropriate. And and at the very least, I hope that it could be a cautionary tale to people who are who are up and coming that, you know, you have to really appreciate every chance you get because you have no idea uh, what's going to happen, you know, the next day. Most definitely. I think. uh... I think in light of our time time crunch, I think that's kind of a good place to, to end. Um, sure. So, you know, you're working with Ross. Uh, the album's coming out via Enjoy the Ride Records. Uh, I don't think there's a, an actual street date for this thing yet, but uh, what uh, I always like to end these episodes out with a song. So what song from the record would you like me to play it out to and maybe give a little backstory on the on the song itself? Oh, crap. Let me, uh, let me go look because... I really want to get you a good one. Um, 
do, 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 do. I'm looking at the track listing. And what's really cool about this is, uh, like, some of the artwork that you'll see. Yeah, I saw uh, it. Ross sent it to me. Yeah, dude. It's, it's like in a old CD sleeve. Like, people are like, what's a fucking CD sleeve? <laughs> and, like, you know, it has, like, an iPad on, iPod on the back. Like, what's an iPod? I don't even know. So I'm not even sure if it's relevant to kids today. All you, uh, you hip kids. But, it definitely um, has that feeling of like a DIY artist, you know, just handing out their, their stuff, trying to, you know, just get their music out there, which I think is exactly what the sort of the background story on this is. So I think it's all, all very fitting. Totally. And I'm just scrolling through, uh, I'm, I'm scrolling through like the track listing to make sure that I, I get to something that that's decent. Um, cause I, so I'd rather give you one of the songs that I did, um, as like by myself okay i think that uh changing of the guard would be a really appropriate song because i had a song called knights of the island counter um that was probably probably like my most famous song for whatever the fuck that's worth at this point but this changing of the guard was basically supposed to be part two it's like knights of the island counter was when we when we partied and changing of the guard is when we woke up and like what the aftermath of that was. Right. And so, you know, like my, like uh, my, my music is very like little literary. I, I don't know if, or cinematic, however the hell you want to put it. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, so that's why I think it's really cool. Cause mostly if anyone has heard of me, it's been nice. And like this song is kind of the, you know, the empire strikes back to, to, to that song. So, um, I think it would be really cool for people if they only listen to one song, then if it's that song, I, I think it'll be pretty cool. And then lastly, where can people find you across your socials? Yeah, so at Dave Can Do It is, is everything. Uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, there's a Dave Malillo YouTube. I'm really not sure, but just type in my name. There's not many people that have it. Um, <laughs> but I, I do most of my stuff through Instagram. So at Dave Can Do It. Okay. Well, thank you for uh, for taking the time to chat with me about this, and uh, very much looking forward to uh, this this whole project coming out, and hopefully people finally getting a chance to hear all these songs from a long time ago, and uh, just the crazy backstory on on what happened. Yeah, thank you, John. I really appreciate your time as well, man. Yeah, well, enjoy the rest of your night. All right, talk to you later. Bye bye. So that was my chat with Dave Malilo of himself and formerly acute is what we aim for had a really great time doing that chat uh like i said in the interview itself i went into it with uh really no preparation i just uh you know knew the guy's backstory a little bit and having just watched that 30 seconds to mars documentary felt like i was in a really good headspace to kind of to k- tackle that and i'm actually kind of finding that uh off the cuffing these has, has been a lot of fun and kind of leads to more honest sincere interesting conversations dan what'd you think of it yeah, I mean, I, I like the honesty the most. And the dude was not, like, afraid to, you know, name names, so to speak. And well, uh, I guess when you're out of the industry, though, there's really <laughs> no bridge to burn. Right, <laughs> who, who gives a shit, right? But, like, no, I, I thought it was a really cool discussion because, you know, that's it's sadly becoming an all-too-familiar story, you know, with a lot of these artists that were, like, on the cusp of breaking at that time. Yeah. And and to hear just how these labels were treating them, you know, because like you think of like drive through records is like, you know, the cool punk rock label, like they'd be cool with everything or whatever. But then you're like, oh, shit. Well, all this punk rock and like emo and screamo or whatever you want to call it, you know, was coming out of this label, but it was still being run by assholes in suits. You know, it kind of kind of takes away from the memory a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. I thought it was really cool, you know, that he is getting an opportunity to kind of release what he thought was going to be a good next step for him. But I also respect that he's like, you know, look, I mean, this this shit might sound kind of primitive because this is basically like my old high school essays, you know, <laughs> like um, right. this is this is old shit that I, I have moved past. But I think it's really cool that it, that it's getting released and, um, you know, we get to actually hear what the original intent was. And uh, definitely not uh, something that I was familiar with prior. But, you know, that's the great thing about podcasting is you get somebody on and you hear their story and you are a little bit more invested in what's going on. You know, you've got that really necessary context going into a project. Uh, And I I really uh, I feel bad. You know, I don't feel bad for him because I'm obviously he's doing well for himself now. But 
um, you know, just the shit that he had to go through, you know, basically being told like, oh man, you're great. You're awesome. You're great. And then like on Tuesday of your new job, it's like, oh, by the way, you suck. <laughs> you know, like that's a total mind fuck, you know? And like, but I mean, it seems like he handled it with grace, you know, and it was, it was all good. Yeah. It was kind of interesting, you know, and something I don't think a lot of people really think of, and I don't know if I think about it too much because I bring it up all the time, but just the, the concept of, being a product for someone where you have to start thinking about moving units and making money and, and you are not you as a person, but now you are the thing that someone, a commodity that someone is going to sell and use until you are no longer valuable to them. And it's like, like I said, at like a sophomore or a junior still in high school, it's like I had, I didn't want any responsibility. I was like terrified to talk to girls that I thought were attractive and I loved, you know, playing sports. I couldn't imagine if someone was like, okay, well, we're going to pick you out of this thing. And, you know, now you're in the real world where adults are looking at you, you know, with dollar signs in their eyes. And it's like, how the, like, that can't do anything but stone your fucking growth as a person. Well, yeah. I mean, and it's an artist too, because like now, you know, before it was a muse, it was an emotional outlet for you. And now it's like, well, now I have to like, outlet these emotions but it not seem like i'm talking shit on the people that are like paying for it right. you know like, but like at that point when you're that young you know this label becomes the biggest source of your stress and your frustration and it's you know it's like you just have to deliver 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 and it's like this is somebody that hasn't ever worked a full-time job yet right like or how how are they going to understand that like Everything I'm doing, all the blood, sweat, and tears that I'm putting into this is all for the benefit of another person. Yeah, and on top of that, I mean, I, I like you said, I just don't even understand how you would potentially go from, you know, someone being like, oh, my God, I love everything you're doing. Everything's great. And then it's like when you start handing them in the next batch of things, they're like, this sucks. However, getting to work with John Feldman back when he did was something that, I mean, like I said, that's John Feldman as a producer, not the guy from Goldfinger, where it's just like, holy shit, I'm getting to work with a dude who, like, everything this dude's touching right now is, like, just blowing up. Taking everyone Turning to that. gold, yeah. Yeah, and it's like, how how would that not... How would you not think that the working with this dude's gonna do the same thing for you? Only to have everything pan out the way it did. And it's like, ugh. And then, you know, the crazy thing, too, and even when I was listening back to this today, the whole, like, oh, I almost signed with Fuel by Ramen, and, and, you know, they had this, you know, young band called <laughs> Fall Out Boy, and had just signed a, a young Haley Williams, and they're building a band around her, and then you just yeah. sit there and go, like, oh, and Gym Class Heroes is right around the corner, as was, like, you know, Panic at the Disco, and it's, like... 21 like, Pilots? Yeah. yeah like... and it's, like, all the bands that, you know, were on that label, and it's, like, oh, man, like, just looking back on it, you're probably, like he said, he's, like, you know, I guess I just made the wrong decision. <laughs> At the wrong yeah, time. That's wrong. But you have no way of knowing because at that time, Drive Through Records was the shit. Yeah. You know, they were the label you wanted to be on. And, like, and I feel like a lot of the bands felt the same way about Victory and about Trust Kill, you know? Yeah. That, like, these were going to be the labels that were going to carry you further than you could ever go on your own. And uh, it's really sad that, you know, they just kind of broke people like that. And, you know, it's it's a good thing, in my opinion, that some of those labels aren't even, like, really existing anymore in the same form that they did before. Because it's like, man, you know, you look at a regular job place, you know, and like you were saying, John, about age and stuff, like, nobody wants to hire somebody that's older or whatever. But it's like, in a real workplace, like, that shit would never fly. So, like, why is it okay in the record industry? You know. know, there's so many horror stories of things that happen within it and things that people do that it's like if you were to put those in real world context, it's like there would be lawsuits of plenty. Not saying they're not in the in the music industry, but there's just so many things where it's like that would never happen in in other industries, right? As frequently, because someone would come in and be like, "This, you know, Better Business Bureau or whatever. Like these are not good practices to have." And en enough people would be like, "Well, fuck you." I mean, like you said, he had a four-record contract, and they wouldn't even let him do the first one. <laughs> right. They're just like, man, all your ideas suck balls. It's like, what do you want me to do, man? Yeah. Like, I, you, you, you signed me because you thought I had what it took, and now you're telling me I don't. So, like, I mean, just let me out of my contract then. Yeah. If it's that big of a deal. Oh, but they never want to do that. Yeah. 
you know, because you might have some great idea later on down the line that they could profit from. Well, see, that was the funny thing about the 30 Seconds to Mars thing is that Jared had Jared Leto had posted a video of him, or it was on Instagram. He just had like a quick little snippet of him fucking around on on piano or whatever. wasn't for a record, wasn't for anything. He was just just noodling around. And then it, at some point in the documentary, spoilers, I guess, but not really since it's like almost 10 years old. If you can watch it on YouTube, it's yeah, it's old. on YouTube, um, and it's it's a really beautiful documentary, but uh, shot anyway. But it was a thing where the label was trying to say that they owned that too. Any huh. music potentially that could be recorded or was or whatever they own, and he's like, I was literally just noodling around; it wasn't anything. And he was, and they're saying they own that, and they were like, Yeah, that's what they're saying. And he was so like, Jared Jesus Leto Christ. shows up on the set of Suicide Squad and whistles a tune. They own that too. Well, here's the funny thing. So the and again, spoilers, but not really. It's it's all public knowledge at this point. So EMI basically the the band signed the con redid a contract that they were fighting for. Uh, the lawsuit was dropped. Uh, more or less, their debt was like sounded like it was forgiven, and then basically the company went under, <laughs> and all this shit. So basically, this like whole almost two year or like year and a half process of the lawsuit was for nothing because the label just folded basically, but. Huh. And then they, well, you know, they, and then it ends with them saying the label saying that the band still owed them like one point seven million dollars. That's what happens whenever you, um, you know, are using you know a twenty year old business model. Well, that was know. the crazy thing in it though is that they were talking about how they're the antiquated, antiquated, antiquated. Uh, there we go. Antiquated. Well, yeah, antiquated. Thank you. Uh, technology and verbiage in the the recording contracts basically stated that like there was a a packaging fee. There was a. Uh, broken records or broken cds you know fee attached into it and you know they were these things like that's like, the band's fault well the, when they signed the contract all of that was still relevant but now they're like we're in digital we don't really sell cds or vinyl or anything so why are we paying this extra fee for something that's not even applied to our product and then on top of that they were talking about how uh in some instances too you know labels work out a thing with like best buy where it's like oh if you buy this many we'll give you blank amount of cds for free and then they're like and the, those end up coming out of our cost and it's like you know we just did the math you know and, and you know like just the numbers break down of everything like outside of this conversation and you know I, I talk about this documentary quite a bit in both the intro the interview and now here in the outro but it's one of those where i mean you look at a band like 30 seconds to mars and, and the public perception would be oh my god this band with having jared leto who's a big movie star quote unquote in it you know probably makes so much money and so on and so forth and they're probably immune to all the bullshit of the music industry and i you know for anyone who's slightly interested in how the mechanics of the industry work i i dare you to watch that and not walk away having your mind changed about what you think you know about the industry and how it actually works even at that level well, yeah, and uh, Jared's book, uh, True Rock Stars, has a lot of that in there, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's there's definitely, we're in an age now where everybody's not afraid to talk about it anymore, and that's uh, that's awesome. We get to have these cool interviews and kind of get the inside scoop on how things were going. Speaking of having the inside scoop, if you would like to keep up with Dave and his unreleased LP sessions, You've Got Potential, they will be available this Friday, July 27th at noon Eastern Standard Time via EnjoyTheRideRecords.com. Again, the new album, You've Got Potential, uh, it's his unreleased album, uh, comes out at noon Eastern Standard Time on this Friday, July 27th, EnjoyTheRideRecords.com. And uh, I don't know if you got a chance to see if I sent you the uh, the artwork for this uh, this album, but basically the the vinyl for it since it's all vinyl is uh, basically like a, a burnt CD, and they have nice. uh, variants. One's black, one's on clear, and the other is like a, a black and clear splatter. Um, and then the cool thing is the test press is actually done like an old iPod classic. It's uh, I wish that was the actual album, but. Uh, like the way it is when you when you buy it for anybody, but uh, it is a really cool looking project. Enjoy the ride records uh, does a lot of great shit. Uh, you know they did uh, a lot of the Harvard stuff. Actually, all the Harvard stuff. Um, they've done. They just most recently put out the Transformers uh, soundtrack. They got a lot of cool different things. A lot of nostalgia type stuff attached to the th uh, these projects. And Ross always puts a lot of work into. Everything he does, all the jackets, everything, all the artwork, and really goes out of his way to create a really quality product. So uh, big thanks to Ross and Enjoy the Ride Records for uh, helping me get this interview and for uh, 
just all the support of uh, Ross has given me over the last year or so doing this podcast and everything. And, uh, and if you would like to find Dave, you can find him at on Instagram at Dave Malillo Music, and you can also find him at Dave Can Do It. Twitter is at Dave Can Do It, and you can find him at D-M-E-L-I-L-L-O music.com. And if you would like to follow our partners at Moshpit Nation, you can find them on moshpitnation.com. You can find them on Facebook at facebook.com backslash West capital M-I. And you can find them on Twitter and Instagram simply at Moshpit Nation. Dan, where can everyone find you? You can follow me on Twitter at DiscussMetalDan. You can find my other podcast, Discography Discussion, on Facebook at facebook.com slash Discography Discussion, as well as uh, Instagram. We are under Discography Discussion as well. And, uh, you know, the thing every podcast always tells you to do, rate, review, subscribe. Dan has his uh, patented answer down for why we like reviews. Uh, So, Dan, why don't you go ahead and tell the people why reviewing matters. We love reviews on John's Untitled Podcast. And the reason for that is because we live in a world of digital algorithm-based recommendations. The more reviews a podcast gets, the more likely we are to be recommended to people that listen to similar podcasts and want to hear more greatness. Therefore, if you review our podcast, it helps us get exposure. It helps us out almost more than it helps sending us money. Of course, you are always welcome to send us money. However, a review will work just fine. So we appreciate all of your guys' feedback. And if you think there's something we could be doing better, let us know. Be constructively critical. If you would like to keep up with everything going on with the podcast, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at John's Entitled Podcast. Tweet at us at John's Entitled Pod, and email us at John's Entitled Pod at gmail.com. Going to end this episode as we always do with a song, and as you heard Dave say in the interview, he wanted me to end it to Changing of the Guard, so we're going to end it with that song, and we will talk to you guys next week. to p.m. Wound up wasting the day away again. Sunday evening begins at 11.05 when we get into the car and start to drive. I never want to say goodbye. been driving down this street It's January here so we still can feel the heat And that Spanish woman's working at the local store She used to card us but she doesn't care no more And well, we got it just in time
Monday morning starts at 8 a.m. Wind up waking, long tired again. I step outside, alright, to meet the bright blue sky. And as I get into the car and start to drive, I can say. 